related to the aerial photography, then you are getting the ortho rectified photographs, relief, and other displacements will be there. Once you carry out all the corrections, then you can make use of the aerial photography for the generation of the topographical maps. Next slide. So now we have the basic elements. You have the fiducial marks. Now, what are the fiducial marks? See, normally on an aerial photograph, you have the index marks. Index marks are represented at the four corners or at the center of the edges of the aerial photograph. By joining the opposite fiducial marks, you are getting the principal point. Now, why you require the principal point? Suppose you have two successive overlapped aerial photographs. Successive overlapped aerial photographs are normally called as stereo pairs. In the sense, when the aircraft is here, it takes the photograph of this much area, let us say AB. When it goes to another position, the same area will be covered but from a different angle. And in this process, you are getting a coverage of CD. Now, CB is common in both the photographs. That means, whatever the features you are observing, on the right side of the left photo is being repeated on the left side of the right photo. In this process, some area will be common. That means they are called as overlap aerial photographs and they are also called as stereo pairs. And when you keep the stereo pairs under the mirror stereoscope, there is a device called stereoscope. If you keep this stereo pairs under the stereoscope and if you choose it properly, you are getting a three-dimensional view of the terrain. That means I can go for quantitative measurement by making use of this overlap aerial photograph. That is what photogrammetry says. You are deriving some quantitative information and you are transferring it to that of the map in the form of contours. Just now I said 20, 40, 60. Why you require the contours? With the help of contours, one can generate a slope map where you have the steepest slope, where you have the gentler slope and all. For number of applications, we require this contour information as well as slope information because whenever there is a landslide, because in the steepest slope, more will be the uh, damage factors normally whenever there is a landslide and all. And if you have the steeper slope, in case of groundwater and all, more runoff will be there. The infiltration will be less in such a terrain. So even for engineering purposes, where you have the steepest slope, where to fill, where to cut the land and all. For number of applications, we require the contour information and even for military operations, we require that. So that we can get to aerial photographs. For that, we have the index marks marked at the four corners. By joining this, we are getting the principal point and the ground nugget means the point which lies below the camera exactly on the ground. That is called as ground nugget point. And on the photographic printout, it is called as photographic nadir. Then bisect of the angle between the principal point and the nadir, that is called as isocenter. And see, this is how the aerial photographic task is being carried out. Normally in India, there are three flying agencies, they take up the flying task for aerial photography. They are Indian Air Force, Aerial Survey Company and National Remote Sensing Service Center. They take up the flying task for aerial photography. Whenever we need the aerial photography for a specific purpose, we have to get the permission from the surveyor general and we have to send all the required details to the surveyor general. And then surveyor general will ask one of the flying agencies to take up the flying task for aerial photography. And they will fly and take the photograph. If the task is carried out by Indian Air Force, that is suffixed by the letter capital A, if it is by Indian Air Force, it is suffixed by the letter B and if it is from National Remote Sensing Service Center, you can see capital C on the aerial photographs. See, this is how the aerial photographic task is being carried out. See, this is the flight direction and the aircraft will fly and see, you can see some successive overlap aerial photographs here. It will come, this is no photographic zone. This is the second strip, third strip. Like that, you have continuous strips will be there. And along the flight line, this is called as forward overlap. Normally, 50 to 60 percent forward overlap is required so that one can get the 3D view of the terrain. So, between the six, some area will be common that is called as the side lap. So, normally, forward overlap is 50 to 60 percent, and side lap will be from 20 to 30 percent so that one can compile the mosaic. Mosaics are nothing but see, you see here, you have number of aerial photographs. And if you join this overlap aerial photograph systematically, you are getting the pictorial representation of the terrain. That means if the terrain is 
very lengthy or there may be a river running for hundreds of kilometers on a single photograph you may not cover the information of the entire area in such a scenario you have to compile the photographs in a systematic manner by seeing the common features present in the photographs so at the end you are getting the pictorial representation of the terrain this is how we are getting the aerial photographs with 50 to 60 percent forward overlap and 5 to 15 percent side lap next slide so in case of aerial remote sensing normally in remote sensing we require the sources of energy and doubt this is of course in case of satellite remote sensing but see in the case of aerial remote sensing we go for see these are the sensing systems of course this is the satellites so we have the sources of energy so sun is the chief source for the electromagnetic radiation it has to pass through the atmosphere so scattering and absorption will take place finally part of the light will be reaching the earth's surface it interacts with the earth's surface features and retransmission will take place this retransmitted energy will be collected by low altitude aircraft medium altitude aircraft and high altitude spacecrafts so in this process especially in the case of satellites we are getting the satellite images but in the case of aerial photography we are getting the aerial photographs that we are processing it in sufficient forward overlap and side lap we are getting the aerial photographs then from the aerial photographs sunmap india generates the topographical maps and these kind of maps can also be used to generate different kinds of thematic maps like one can go for geological mapping what kind of rocks are existing in an area what kind of geological structures are there in fact the detailed geological mapping of an area can be carried out with the help of aerial photographs and already existing geological maps are available that can be updated with the help of aerial photographs because the earlier maps were generated based on conventional techniques of course now we have a powerful technology of aerial remote sensing and satellite remote sensing and we are making use of this visible region of the spectrum especially in aerial photography then if you go for satellite remote sensing we are making use of this infrared near infrared mid infrared thermal infrared then we are making use of the microwave region of the spectrum so we have hyperspectral remote sensing we have lidar technologies available so with all these technologies definitely we can extract maximum information about the earth resources and normally in the case of aerial photograph the end product will be an aerial photograph and which will be analyzed through visual techniques that means we are making use of this stereoscopes pocket stereoscope mirror stereoscopes at the end we are generating some topographical maps or other kind of thematic maps so this is the basic principle normally in aerial photography or satellite remote sensing the energy sun's energy will be reaching the earth's surface it interacts with the earth's surface features and retransmission will take will be taking place this will be recorded by a sensor of a satellite or sensor of an aircraft see our eyes are acting as sensors but our eye has the limitations we can analyze the surface features visually in the region of 400 to 700 nanometer or 0.4 to 0.7 micrometer range of the spectrum so normally in case of aerial photography we make use of this visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum so this is about the digital soft soft copy photogrammetry so it is also called as advanced photogrammetry see in the initial stages we were using this monolog photogrammetry in the sense cameras were used and the hard copies of the aerial photographs were available that was analyzed using stereoscope and some devices and at the end they generated the topographical map see input was a hard copy processing was carried out manually and the end product was most of the time it was a hard copy of a topographical map that is what it is called as analog photogrammetry the technology advanced they started scanning the aerial photographs and converted it to digital mode and some computer processing was carried out on those photographs and again most of the time the end product was a hard copy but for special purposes they went for soft soft copies that was analytical they started scanning the photographs but now we talk about soft copy photogrammetry or advanced photogrammetry or digital photogrammetry wherein the soft copy the input is an aerial camera in the digital mode the processing is being carried out using computers 
we have different types of software packages are available like like a photogrammetry suit and all and with that we can extract some meaningful information and at the end we are generating the topographical maps which are available in the digital mode and that is called as soft copy photogrammetry so we are from the analog to analytical to digital photogrammetry so that the entire product is available in the digital mode the advantage of digital mode is see now the satellite images are also available in the digital mode and if you have the aerial photographs are also in the digital mode it is easy for you to do the georeferencing and you can integrate different layers that is the advantage of digital data so this is the electromagnetic spectrum of course in case of aerial photography we make use of this visible region from 400 to 700 but in the case of satellite remote sensing beyond the visible region is also used but normally in terrestrial remote sensing we do not make use of this region of the spectrum because these wavelengths are absorbed by the atmosphere atmosphere does not allow these wavelengths to reach the surface because atmosphere is made up of gaseous molecules dust particles and all so that is why we are not getting especially we are not at all use, using this particular spectrum for terrestrial remote sensing but when we talk about the planetary remote sensing outer planets outer stars these wavelengths are useful next slide so in case of aerial photography let us see what are the advantages aerial photography offers an improved vantage point yes we are getting the required information from 3d perspective so we can make use of this for number of applications so better results can be obtained through the analysis of aerial photographs aerial photography has the capability to stop action yes if there are some illegal actions are going on or mining activities are going on immediately we can stop because we have the information available in the form of aerial photographs we have the data available so we can stop such kind of action for example some illegal sand mining may be taking place in a particular area if we have the aerial photograph we are getting that kind of information and it provides a permanent recording see once we have the aerial photographs see even if you request survey in India they will generate they provide you the topographical maps as well as the aerial photographs they are available from 1960 onwards even topographical maps are available from 67 and we have the aerial photographs once in 10 years uh, data are available that one can make use of because it is a permanent recording it has a broader spectral sensitivity than the human eye because we have the limitations but in the case of aerial photography it provides you the broad spectral sensitivity than the human eye it has a better spatial resolution in the sense we even the smallest object on the earth's surface when we talk about satellites we say 40 centimeter 50 centimeter or 60 centimeter object on the earth's surface now can be detected through satellites but they are having 700 to 800 kilometer altitude but the aircraft is flying at a lower altitude but definitely by using this aerial photographic techniques even we can think of getting a high resolution maybe 10 centimeter 5 centimeter resolution photographs so that is the advantage in the case of aerial photography so this is how we have to do the interpretation yes this gentleman is making the observation see some area will be common in both the photographs of course he is using the stereoscope especially the mirror stereoscope for getting the three dimensional view of the terrain and with this you can do the interpretation of the aerial photographs like you go for uh, texture, shape, size, associated features make use of the tonal criteria see what kind of frequency of tonal changes are there that is called as texture then relative amount of light reflected by an object that is called as tone so like that what is the shape of the object whether it is having the circular shape in case of a stadium cricket stadium, baseball stadium, football stadium can be differentiated based on the shape like that size, associated features, shadow effect you convert all these evidences and say what type of surface feature it is that is nothing but we are doing the interpretation that means we have the set of aerial photographs I said in the beginning aerial photographs can be used to generate the topographical map and at the same time these photographs can be used to generate different kinds of schematic maps so that information you can extract by making use of these different recognition elements criteria 
then convert all the evidences and say what type of surface feature, geological feature is existing, geomorphological feature is existing like that. So simultaneously you have to observe these two photographs from the two eyes. So at one particular juncture, if you fuse it properly, you are getting the stereoscopic vision. That means you are feeling like flying on an aircraft and seeing the terrain. Next slide. See, this is how we are making use of various platforms for remotely collecting the data. Of course, this is the space platform from an altitude of 700 to 900 kilometer in case of polar orbiting satellites. And in case of geostationary satellites, it is about 36,000 kilometer. But in case of aerial platform, we have low altitude data, medium altitude data. Then even from the ground, we can collect the required information. But in this process, there is no physical contact with the object. That is what remote sensing says. Without any physical contact, we are remotely collecting the data and by analyzing this data, we are getting some useful information and of course, in the case of aerial photography, we are making use of the visible region of the spectrum and there is no physical contact with the object. When the aircraft collects the data, there is no physical contact. In a similar way, when the spacecraft collects the data in the form of image, there is no physical contact. That is what it is called as remote sensing. So we are making use of these ground-based platforms, airborne platforms, space-borne platforms, as well as high-altitude spacecrafts for sensing the earth surface features. See, this is again different platforms. This is of course based on the satellite. Next. See, aerial photography is one of the most common versatile and economical forms of remote sensing. It is means of fixing time within the framework of space. Then was the first method, this aerial photography was the first method of remote sensing and even, even today it is being used in the era of satellites and electronic scanners and these photographs will still remain the most widely used type of remote sensing data according to Abraham Thomas. So he did a lot of work based on aerial photographs and aerial photographs which were taken from balloons and kites as early as mid 1800s and during 1858 Gospar Felix Tomakom Nader took the first aerial photograph from a captive balloon from an altitude of 1200 feet over Paris. So these were the, in the initial stages, then the same technologies they started using for civilian applications. See some of the characteristics of spectral and spatial resolution which are providing they are sensitive to radiation in wavelengths that are outside of the spectral sensitivity of the human eye. Sometimes we can sense up to 0.9 micrometer. Normally we can sense, human eye can sense from 0.4 to 0.7. But see in the case of aerial photography, <coughs> sometimes we can go from 0.3 to 0.9 micrometer. See human eye can sense only at this particular wavelength. They are sensitive to objects outside the spatial resolution power of human eye. That is what I said from a lower altitude, if you are using some sophisticated cameras, even you can improve the resolution, spatial resolution of that particular sensor or camera. Availability, aerial photographs are readily available at a range of scales for much of the world. They are available on different scales. I said in the beginning, photography scale is normally derived based on the focal length as well as the flying height. Focal length remains constant. Focal length divided by flying height will give you the scale of the aerial photograph and smaller the scale you will get more details. Larger the smaller the scale means sorry, smaller the scale means less details, but it covers larger area. Larger scale means it covers smaller area and it provides more information. When we say 1 is to 50,000 or 1 is to 25,000, 25,000 will provide more information than 1 is to 50,000. Then economy they are they are much cheaper than field surface and are often cheaper and more accurate than maps. That is the advantage. And photography includes photographing an object. Then we are making the measurements using their images of the object on the process photograph. And finally, we are reducing the measurements to some useful form such as topographical map or a numerical cadaster. See, of course, these are of the stereoscopes. See, in case of aerial photography, when the aircraft is here, it covers this much area. When it goes to another position, the same piece of land is being photographed but from a different angle and you are getting sufficient overlap in both the photographs. 
These successive overlap aerial photographs are called as stereo pairs. And when you observe such stereo pairs under the stereoscope, you are getting a three-dimensional view of the terrain. That is the advantage. And you can analyze the aerial photographs by using an instrument called stereoscope. So overlap in flight direction, I said it is normally 60% because you have to get the stereoscopic vision. Side phase between the strips, it is called as side lap, it is 20 to 30% and it is a central perspective projection and you are getting the stereoscopic parallax in the flight direction because there is a difference in the shifting the point of observation that results in the parallax. Next slide. See, this is what the forward overlap. See, this much area is covered from this position and when the aircraft goes to this position, this much area will be covered. In this process, this much area is common in both the photographs. This is between the strips. This is required to compile the mosaic. Maybe you can just one more slide may be there. Next. This is how we can compile the mosaic. See, by making use of number of aerial photographs, see, because you are getting the pictorial representation at the end, so you have some common overlap. See, we talk about mosaics. An aerial mosaic is a group array of overlapping aerial photographs. They are nothing but group of aerial photographs. And which are systematically assembled. You are assembling it in a systematic manner. And at the end you are getting the continuous pictorial representation of a terrain. Mosaics are useful for planning purposes and even for photogeological studies. And they provide an overview of the nature of the terrain and which helps in forming an impression in the interpreter's mind about the photographic texture. These are types of aerial photographs depending upon the inclination of the optic axis of the camera. We have low oblique, high oblique as well as vertical aerial photographs. In the case of vertical aerial photographs, the optic axis is kept vertical and in the case of oblique aerial photographs, it is inclined and again if the inclination is sufficient, means if you are in a position to see the horizon, that is called as high oblique aerial photographs. In the case of low oblique aerial photographs, we cannot see the horizon. Of course, this is an aerial photograph. So again, low and high oblique aerial photographs. Okay, these are the photographs taken with this technique, vertical, low oblique and high oblique. And I will stop here and maybe we can continue it in the next class. Thank you. Friends, morning we discussed about the geometry of aerial photographs. Now let us discuss on geometric characteristics, that is about the photo scale. So scale of aerial photographs are normally calculated using the photo distance by map distance. And here the scale of a photograph expresses the mathematical relationship between a distance measured on the photo and a distance measured on the ground, corresponding distance measured on the ground. For example, if the scale of the aerial photograph is 1 is to 50,000, that means one unit on the map represents 50,000 units on the ground. That means a photographic scale is an expression that states one unit of distance on a photograph represents a specific number of units of actual ground distance. For example, on 1 is to 250,000 scale, one centimeter on the map is equivalent to 250,000 centimeters on the ground that is nothing but 1 is to 2 lakh 50,000 so scales may be expressed as unit equivalence that is 1 millimeter is equal to 25 meter representative fractions 1 over 25,000 or ratios that is 1 is to 25,000 that means 1 unit on the map represents 25,000 units on the ground unlike maps which have a constant scale throughout the aerial photographs have a range of scales that means in case of aerial photograph, the scale is calculated using focal length divided by flying height. The flying height varies from terrain to terrain, whereas the focal length remains constant. Normally in India, we make use of this 152 millimeter focal length lens for calculating the uh, scale. 152 millimeter focal length cameras are normally used. That means Focal length remains constant 152 millimeter, whereas the terrain is undulatory and that is why scale varies from place to place in the case of aerial photographs. But in the case of topographical maps, throughout the map the scale will be uniform. So the most straightforward method for determining photo scale is to measure the corresponding photo and ground distance 
between any two points that means the scale capital s is the computed value that is the ratio of the photo distance small d to the ground distance capital d that means if i measure 1 cm on the map and if the ground distance is 1 km that means 1 cm means 1000 into 100 that means 1 km is 100 meter then 1 meter is 100 cm so that will be 1 lakh scale 1 unit on the map is equivalent to that many units on the ground so then capital S is nothing but the photo scale that is photo distance by ground distance that means whatever the distance you are measuring on the photo the same corresponding distance you must measure it on the ground then divide the photo distance by ground distance that will give you the scale next slide so here we are talking about the photogrammetric one station in the beginning I said we started with analog photogrammetry then we went for analytical photogrammetry and now we talk about digital photogrammetry so in the case of digital photogrammetry we are making use of this photogrammetric workstation of course we are having light of photogrammetry suit wherein we can make the measurement on the digital data so especially photogrammetric workstation involves integrated hardware and software systems for spatial data capture that means if we have the cameras then we have collecting the data, we are collecting the data using the digital cameras and we are getting the spatial data so that is being used to capture the spatial data then since the data is available in the digital mode we can do a lot of manipulation because so that we can enhance the image so that is the advantage in the case of digital photogrammetry we can capture the data then we can do the manipulation then we can carry out different types of analysis we can store the data, we can display and output of soft copy images unlike analog photogrammetry the input is aerial photographs processing is being carried out manually the output is a hard copy of a topographical map but in this case digital photogrammetry even the output will be the soft copy input is aerial cameras input in the digital mode processing is being carried out a computer then the output is also in the soft copy format and it is nothing but a soft copy of a topographical map so these systems incorporate functionality of analytical stereo quarters automated generation of digital elevation models so we are getting digital elevation models then computation of digital ortho photos ortho photos means that the rectified photograph whatever the errors will be there that will be rectified then preparation of perspective views and captures 2D and 3D data for use in a geographical information system. Next slide. So we have different kinds of stereoscopes that are normally used to get the 3D view of the terrain. So this is a pocket stereoscope where the aerial photographic dimension will be less and smaller area can be viewed with the help of pocket stereoscope. And normally we are making use of this pocket stereoscope to get the 3D view of the stereograms. Stereograms are nothing but the aerial photographs are set in a position in such a way that you can take the photograph of that again you can make use of that for stereoscopic vision normally small pocket stereoscopes are used for that purpose in fact in the case of mirror stereoscope you can go for the analysis of 23 centimeter by 23 centimeter aerial photographs so for normal vision you have to keep the left foot on the left side and right foot on the right side then if you see it properly use it properly then you are getting the three dimensional view of the terrain of course it is attached with a parallax bar and with that you can measure the height and all so scanning stereoscope so simultaneously two persons can view this so instructor as well as the student can make use of this system and so that you can get the required stereoscopic vision so like that interpreter scope interpreter scope so these are nothing but device, different types of devices normally used to get the 3D view of the terrain. Now let us discuss some of the advantages. See, before going for any kind of mapping, one must have the knowledge. What kind of maps must be used and on what scale the terrain should be mapped. See, by selecting the scale of aerial photograph for various natural resources, now we have the largest scale, we have the smallest scale and all. When I say 1 is to 2,50,000, 1 is to 50,000, 1 is to 25,000, 
the one is to two lakh fifty thousand is the smallest, and one is to fifty thousand is the medium, and one is to twenty five thousand is the largest. That means one will be numerator, two lakh fifty thousand will be the denominator in case of one into two lakh. So one over two lakh fifty thousand will be definitely smaller than one over twenty five thousand. So let us discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages of large and small scale aerial photographs or any kind of topographical maps because we are going to make use of this for number of applications for natural resources mapping for geological mapping for the generation of thematic maps and those now let us discuss some of the advantages of small scale just now i said small scale means of the three one is to 250000 one is to 50000 One is to twenty-five thousand. One is to two lakh fifty thousand is the smallest. And what are the advantages of that? Regional picture is obtained. That means small scale covers larger area. Because on one is to two lakh fifty thousand, you will get maybe five to six districts may be covered on one is to two lakh fifty thousand. It covers larger area, but it provides lesser information. That means regional picture is obtained. Maybe if you want to cover larger area. It is better to go for small scale. Then association of futures is clearly brought out. In the sense, what are the futures associated with different surface features? So that you will be able to see with clarity. Association of futures is clearly brought out in the case of small scale. Then number of photos is less, reducing cost and labor. In the sense, small scale aerial photographs cover larger area. Just now I said. And if you want to cover the entire district of Bhojanagar or entire taluk of Mangalore, you may require less number of photos because it covers larger area. You must have seen the atlases. The entire world is represented on one is to fifteen crores or fifty crores. That means it is a small scale. The entire world is represented on A4 size. But if we go for larger and larger scale, that means we require more number of photographs or topographical maps. And even the Panajja University campus is not sufficient. Even if we spread over the topographical maps, we will not be able to represent the entire world because it covers larger area. Large scale covers uh, smaller area, but smaller scale covers larger area. That means we require less number of photographs. It reduces the cost and labor. Then mosaic making is easier in the sense. Mosaic means it is nothing but when we talk about aerial mosaics, aerial mosaics are nothing but overlapped aerial photographs which have been systematically assembled and at the end we are getting the pictorial representation of the terrain. So depending upon the compilation of the photographs, we have uncontrolled mosaic, semi-controlled mosaic, and controlled mosaic. But we have to go for mosaic compilation because one photograph may not cover the entire study area. In such cases, we have to arrange the photographs in a systematic manner, and at the end, we are getting the pictorial representation of the terrain. So, smaller scale means we are handling less number of photographs. So, mosaic making is easier. Then, details of topography of larger area are obtained. In the sense, small scale covers larger area. That means, if you want to cover the entire Western Ghats of Karnataka, hardly you may have to handle about 15 to 20 topographical maps. On one is to two lakh fifty thousand. If you want to cover the same area on one is to twenty five thousand, you may require hundreds of topographical maps. So details of topography, the what is the topographic condition of an area, of a larger area, can be obtained by making use of these small scale aerial photographs. But what are the disadvantages of small scale? And low lying areas are obscured in the sense if you have a hill. There may be a shadow effect, or if you have a multi-story building, very close to that building, you will have the shadow effect and all. So because of that, the low-lying areas are obscured, or the information you may not get when you are making use of the small-scale aerial photographs. And surface feature details are not clear in the sense one unit on the map represents two lakh fifty thousand units on the ground. It is two lakh fifty thousand scale. Surface features are not clear because of that. The smallest scale means which cannot represent. I will give you one example. See, if one centimeter means it is two lakh fifty thousand units on the ground means one centimeter is equivalent to two lakh fifty thousand centimeters on the ground. 
And if I go for manual interpretation, if I put a dot, it will become a millimeter, let us say. One millimeter on the map represents <coughs> 2.5 minus divided by 10. That means 2.5 kilometers. That means 250 meters on the map. If I put a dot, it is equal to 250 meters on the ground. If the surface feature is less than that, if its dimension is less than that, it cannot be represented on that scale. That means surface feature details are not clear on a small scale. In such a case, we have to go for larger and larger scale mapping. Next slide. See, in the case of large scale, what are the advantages? Details of topography are well brought out because you have the largest scale, 50,000 or 25,000, if you are going for that kind of mapping, or even 20,000, 10,000. See, there the details of topography, how the land surface is, where you have the undulations, where it is having the highest relief, the lowest relief, all the details you are getting on the larger scale, that is what I said, if you compare 25,000, 20,000, 10,000, 5,000 like that, 25,000 is the smallest, 5,000 is the largest. So that will provide more information if you go for village level mapping, maybe if you are going for the, the mapping of entire country, you may have to go for smaller and smaller scale. But when you are concentrating from India to Karnataka, maybe your aim is to extract more features. In that case, go for medium scale. Again, from Karnataka to Dakshina Kannada, Dakshina Kannada to Mangalore Taluk, Mangalore Taluk to Konaje. If you want to get all the required information of a particular village, all the settlements of a village, if you want to extract, then you have to go for larger and larger scale maps, maybe 1 is to 1000 scale, that kind of map you must generate. So in that case, you are getting all the required details on that map. And even the geological details, I said in the beginning, when we go for geological mapping, our aim is to extract meaningful geological details. What kind of rocks are there? What kind of geological structures are existing? Where we have the folds, where we have the faults, where we have the ligaments and all, jointed rocks are present. So different kinds of rocks plus geological structures must be identified, lithology plus structure must be extracted from the photographs. So you will be able to extract maximum geological details when you go for larger and larger scale maps. But some of the disadvantages are more photos to be handled because larger scale covers smaller area. In that case, if you want to cover more area, you have to handle more photos because of the aerial coverage of an individual photograph will be less then distortion due to relief is more than error. Whenever we go for larger and larger scale maps, even the distortion will be more because I said in the beginning, image get displaced because of the relief and all. So distortion will be more in the case of larger and larger scale. But anyhow, when we go for larger scale maps, we are getting more and more details. It depends upon the purpose for which you make use of the photographs. For larger area, it is better to go for small scale and for smaller area. Now let us discuss the disadvantages of large scale. Since large scale covers smaller area, you have to handle more photos. That means larger scale covers smaller area. So if you are going for village level mapping and or, or taluk level mapping, so in the case of taluk or district, you must handle more number of photographs since it covers smaller area. Then even the distortion due to relief is more in the case of large scale. So we must know before making use of any kind of photographs or images or topographical maps, we must have the knowledge of smallest, smaller scale, larger scale, largest scale, its advantages and disadvantages. Next slide. Now let us see what kind of maps and all we can generate based on the aerial photo interpretation. So there are different kinds of maps which can be generated based on the interpretation of aerial photographs. We can go for geopolitical maps, then topographic maps, of course, which highlights the shaded relief, then photo rectified or standard. On the topographical map, you have the drainage network, you have the contours, the settlements, all the details will be there with the geographical coordinates and all. In a similar way, we can that is nothing but a base map. And we can go for different kinds of thematic maps also, like geology, what kind of rocks are there, what kind of structures are there, lithological structure combined with this called as a detailed geological map. Then we can go for ecosystemic map, so what kind of 
ecosystems are existing in a particular what kind of uh, vegetation and other things are there then meteorological purposes how much of rainfall is there how much of temperature is there how much of humidity is there in a particular region so number of climatic maps in a similar way climatology related so we can go for different kinds of maps based on these data products and many other types new map types are facilitated by use of powerful gis so once we have it is nothing but geographical information system software so if we have all the data in the digital world or we can convert it into digital world the hard copy is to digital world then we can integrate one over the other based on the geographical information system and at the end we will be able to derive some meaningful information from these thematic maps next slide so the maps or the photographs must have some details all especially the maps all maps have some common elements that means it must have the scale on what scale the map has been generated the distance on the map is equal to distance in the real world so if one unit on the map represents so many units on the ground so that should be there on the map so if it is called as a accurate map then whenever we go for this kind of maps we must follow all these things it must have the scale it must have the legend and what the symbols represent on the map if it is representing the geological units then different symbols must be given the standard symbols are there international accepted symbols are there that must be there in a similar way geology geomorphology land use land cover soil so you must follow certain rules the standard symbols must be there then it must have the coordinate system like the latitude longitude then the township and range the projection utm universal transfer market or projection and all all these details should be there then the orientation information normally if you have the latitude and longitude then you will come to know in which direction the north arrow you have to put the north arrow everything so a map must have all these details so so far we have discussed the advantages of small scale and large scale the disadvantages of this scale so before going to make use of any kind of thematic maps or the topographical maps so you must have the knowledge of the advantages and disadvantages i hope this is clear for you thank you